Now, we're turning in the Word of God together, please, to John's Gospel, John's Gospel, chapter 12. John's Gospel, chapter 12. I'd like to uh, break into the chapter at the verse 20, and we're going to read through to the end of the verse 36. But John's Gospel, chapter 12, beginning at the verse 20, we find that we are in the last week of the Lord's life before the crucifixion. And we find the Lord has certain things to say about what is about to happen. We find the Lord is not ignorant concerning the way he will die, for that is the reason he came. He was born to die. But the Lord talks about it now. John 12, verse 20. The Word of God states, And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, An angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This is he signifying what death he should die. The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou, The Son of Man must be lifted up. Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have light, believe in the light that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. We trust the Lord will bless the public reading of his holy and precious word to each of our hearts. Now at this point in the service, could I welcome you all to the house of God. It is lovely to see each and every one of you here. We also welcome those visiting with us. We trust the Lord will bless each one as we gather about God's Word today. Now, please remember this Sunday is the third Sunday of the month, so this Sunday is our Whitfield College Covenant Offering Day. Then just for members of session and committee, tomorrow night, Monday evening, the session will be meeting at 6.30, and then the committee following that at 8 p.m. Then on Wednesday, the prayer meeting and Bible study at 8 p.m., then on Friday, the Youth Fellowship at 8 p.m. The services next Lord's Day, the Sabbath School at 10.45. Then the morning worship at 12 noon, preceded by a half-hour prayer beginning at 11.30. And then once again, the Gospel Service at 7 p.m., preceded by prayer at 6.30. Now, once again, please do remember the guidelines in regard to COVID-19, any symptoms and Please don't come to the services uh, and please sanitize your hands as you come and, and leave. Please wear the face masks as you enter and exit as well. Uh, and please remember our social distance at this time. These things are all very important 
I would ask you, please remember uh, Mrs. Kearns in your prayers. She does thank all of our churches for the cards and the messages and all of those kind words that were sent to her. She apologizes that she can't answer them all, but she would appreciate each one of our prayers, even for future days. There is the presbytery statement. I'm going to read it again because of its importance in this day uh, that we will be doing as this statement uh, encourages us, uh, us to do. It's a press statement agreed by the presbytery. It simply states the general presbytery of the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster at its monthly meeting held on the 13th of November 2020 agreed on and passed the following statement. We, the ministers and ruling elders of the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster, in recognizing that by means of COVID-19, the Lord's hand of chastening for our sins has been placed upon our own nation and other nations also. And in the face of the spiraling second wave of the virus, and discerning that man does not have the answer to it, and lamenting that our government has not humbled itself to call on Almighty God for his merciful intervention, and believing that all who profess to be God's people should now turn to him in contrition over our own sins and the sins of our nation, and rejoicing that there is pardon for sin through the finished work of Christ, the one mediator between God and men. Hereby issue this call to seek him in repentance from sin, that he might forgive us for our transgressions of his holy law and remove this virus from our midst to the healing of our land. 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So let's please try and act on this as God's people, that we will pray, that we will ask for the Lord's mercy regarding this judgment upon our nation, and that the Lord will turn the tide, and that we will see revival blessing in days to come. Please pray for the sick and those that would love to be out and cannot be out for one reason or another. Please pray for those that have been bereaved of late. But all these announcements are subject to the will and mind of the Lord. We're going to turn in our hymn books again now, please. Hymn number 203. Hymn number 203. A wonderful old hymn, a favorite of mine. I was sinking deep in sin, sinking to rise no more. Overwhelmed by guilt within, mercy I did implore. Then the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. Christ, my Savior, lifted me. Now safe am I. We'll stand as we sing 203, please. Let's stand.
That's wonderful singing. Now, returning in the Word of God together again, please, to John's Gospel and the chapter 12. John's Gospel, chapter 12. We're looking as our text, the verse 32, please. John's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 32. We're going to be looking at the title, uh, A Gospel Promise. A Gospel Promise. And the Word of God states in this place, John 12, verse 32, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. With the Word of God open before us, let's seek the Lord's face in a word of prayer, please. Let us all pray. Eternal God and loving Heavenly Father, we do bow in Thy presence asking for Thy help again at this time. Lord, we have the solemn duty of preaching the gospel of saving grace to sinful men. And Father, we do pray that Thy word will not return unto Thee void. We pray that some soul, whether in the building or in the car park or online, listening in, that some soul may come and find faith alone in Christ alone, even now. Lord, we thank Thee that there is even a gospel to preach tonight. We thank Thee for Calvary. We thank Thee for the blood that was shed. And Lord, I ask for the infilling of the Spirit of God at this point. Lord, I pray that I may be filled so that I may preach the gospel with all the power and in the demonstration of the Spirit of God, and that every word may go forth as thus and thus saith the Lord. Give help now. Open up each and every heart. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What a book John's Gospel is. In chapter 11, we read about Christ raising Lazarus to life again. And in chapter 12, we read in the first two verses of something quite remarkable, something that I'm sure no one here has ever done, but the Lord did it. Look what it says in the first two verses. It says, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. There we find the Lord at the start of our chapter. He now is having supper with a man that not that long ago was dead. Now, I'm sure nobody here has done that. I hope you haven't anyway. But what a remarkable thing this is. You know, there's some people would try and say the Bible is boring. I would submit to them they've never read the Bible. What verses we're reading here? The Lord raising the dead to life. The Lord then sitting with men that were once dead at the start of chapter 12. Then we find in the verses 3 to 8 that Mary anoints the feet of Jesus and Judas Iscariot being the unsaved character in the midst, he murmured at it, of course. 
Then look at the verses 12 through to 15 with me, please. We find that it is essentially in these words, Palm Sunday, a week before the crucifixion. And it says in the verse 12, on the next day, much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. So there we find in our context that essentially the crucifixion isn't that far away now. We're coming within a week of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, what we know here as Palm Sunday. And we know, therefore, only one week to go. So what is on the Lord's heart? What's on the Lord's mind? Well, obviously, it's Calvary. It's His death, the hour of His decrease, as the Lord uh, tells us Himself uh, in Matthew's Gospel. And uh, look with me in the verse 23. We find this theme is constantly on the Lord's mind. Look at verse 23. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. There we find reference to his death. Then verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. There we find a reference again to Calvary. A seed must die before it brings forth Fruit and Christ is going to die before there is the fruit of salvation seen in his own people. Then verse 25, another reference to it. He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. The Lord once again referring to this fact that he's going to give away his life. Then verse 27, it says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me. From this hour, but for this cause I came unto this hour. There we find reference again. Yes, there is a, a worry, a concern. It's on his heart, it's on his mind, but nonetheless, he knows he has come for this hour, for this time, for this salvation. Then look at the verse 28. It says, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Now there we find the Father now uh, speaking. And what a remarkable event that is when you think the Lord is preaching, the Lord is speaking, and then the Lord turns His eyes to heaven and He prays and the Father responds all in an instant. And you know what? The people heard it as well. Verse 29 says, Some thought it thundered, others thought an angel spake. The Lord clarifies it and says, It was for your sakes, so that you understand what's about to happen. Referring to Calvary, uh, again, then we find our text. If I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Another reference to Calvary, which we'll look at in a moment. And then verse 34. It's again in the verse 35 again. You see this, this portion, it's, it's plentiful with reminders of Calvary, what is to come. The Lord is freely speaking about it, and therefore it ought to be no surprise to the disciples, to the people that are listening to him. The Lord hasn't hidden it. It wasn't a thing said in a corner or in a dark room. We find the Lord is talking constantly about Calvary. And you know, my friend, when we come to this text, look at verse 32 again. You may ask, well, what encourages a preacher's heart at times? It's this verse that often encourages my heart. It says, and I, if I be lifted up, from the earth will draw all men unto me. That is a reference to Calvary, but I also believe it's an encouragement to the preacher that when we lift up Christ, and when we preach Christ, and when we show men and women Christ, and when we point men to Christ, then that is the way men will be drawn unto the Father. What an encouragement it is, this gospel promise tonight. And I want you to note four things from this gospel promise with me. I want you to note, number one, the Christ in the gospel promise. The Christ. Look what it says in our text. Repeat it twice. And I, if I. Now there we find a, a reference to a name, to an individual, to a person. And that person is Christ. 
Here we find the Christ of the gospel promise. And if you're in the habit of marking your Bible, underline or circle or highlight those two words, I, because that is the key and that is the foundation to the entire text. Because there we find, if it was to say, if Daniel Henderson were to be lifted up, then no man would be drawn. If it was to be, if the free Presbyterian church is lifted up, then listen, no man would be drawn. You see, this is the key. This is the foundation. This is what we need to remember. It is Christ and Christ alone, the author and finisher of our faith. If I, if Christ be lifted up from the earth, it will draw all men unto me. Now, my friend, you may ask, well, that is a very simple word, a one-letter word, the Christ. Well, who is he? Why is he so important? Why is he so relevant? Why is he so powerful in the sense the verse says that he'll draw all men unto me? Well, come back with me to John's Gospel, chapter 1. If you want to discover who Christ is, then the first five verses here are maybe the best descriptions of who Christ is in case we're in any doubt whatsoever about it. In John chapter 1 and the verse 1, we find at least three fundamental truths about Christ, finding out who He is. It says in John chapter 1 and the verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, there we find number one, He's eternal. He's eternal. Look what it says, in the beginning was the Word. There we find from the very start of creation, from the very beginning of beginning, still He was there. Why? Because He is God. He is eternal. He didn't exist in the sense that He was created by one. He is God. He is self-existent. He is eternal. And there we find He is from the beginning and He will be to the very end. He is eternal and there has never been a time when Christ has not been there. So there we find he's eternal, but then we find he's, he's a member of the Trinity as well. Look what it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. There we find he is a part of the deliberations in the uh, covenant of redemption before the foundation of the world. He, he was with God, he is the second person of the Trinity, he is with the Father, he is with the Spirit. There is a reference once again to the fact that there is a triune God and he is with God, the second person of the Trinity. And then we find further analysis of who He is. He's eternal. He's a member of the Trinity. But also, He's deity. Just in case you doubted it, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He is God. That's who He is. He is divine. He is deity. He is man, yes, as we know Him, walking upon the earth, but He is God as well. He is the God-man. But then, you say, is there any more here of descriptions of who Christ is? Well, look at the verse 3 in John chapter 1. It says something further to this. All things were made by Him. So there we find He is uh, the Creator as well. He played a role and a part of, uh, of creation. If you were to go back to Genesis chapter 1, uh, and you were to read about day 1, and day 2, and day 3, and day 4, and day 5, and day 6, and He rested the seventh day. Christ is a part of all of that. Christ is the Creator. Uh, and in Genesis chapter 1, and the verse 1, in the beginning, God... That, that name God is in the plural, once again referring to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all in this grand work of creation. Then look at the verse 3 of John 1 again. We find something more. It, it says, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Now, just in case you doubted it, there we find it once again re-emphasized that everything we know, everything we see, everything we can feel or touch, the love in our hearts, all of it, every bit of it, it has all come from Christ and His creating work. Then look at the verse 4. What else do we learn about Christ? It says, in Him was life, and the life was the light of man. Now there we find where we have come from, our life physically speaking, you read about that in Genesis 1. We read about the Lord breathing into the nostrils of Adam. Well, it came from the Lord. He gave life physically. 
But why did he come? Why did he live a righteous life? Why did he die an atoning death? Why did he rise from the dead? Why is he coming again? So that we can have spiritual life as well. So that we can have eternal life as John 3 verse 16 talks about. Or do you see what we're learning about Christ here? Just in these verses, he is eternal. He's a member of the Trinity. He is deity. He's the creator. He's the giver of life. Listen, my friend, as we come back to John chapter 12 and we read in our text, and I, if I be lifted up, who are we talking about? We're talking about the Christ, the Messiah, the eternal one, the triune one, the the. the The deity, the member of the Trinity, the creator, the one that is giver of life, God and man, the God-man. If I be lifted up, isn't it wonderful to know that we're not just talking about any man. We're not just talking about a man or a good man or the best of men, but we're talking about the God-man. You see, if Christ was not God, then there would be no salvation for us. There would be no hope for us. And you know something further to that? Christ is impeccable. Come with me to Hebrews chapter 4, please. Hebrews chapter 4 and uh, and the verse 15. Now, we find out all of these things about Christ, and we find out in the Scriptures that He then had the incarnation and came into this world, and and now we find He lived a perfect life, a a perfectly righteous life, but, but something more than that, He did just not sin, but he could not sin as well. And Hebrews 4 in the verse 15 talks about this, talks about Christ as our great high priest. It says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are. And look at these words and highlight them if you're in the habit of marking your Bible. Yet without sin. That tells us something. That tells us something about the impeccability of Christ. That he is perfectly righteous in all and every sense. And because of that, he lived a righteous life for us. Come with me to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Now, Romans chapter 3 is maybe uh, the best chapter in teaching us concerning our sin teaching us concerning our own unrighteousness, teaching us concerning our own hopelessness in and of ourselves. But Romans chapter 3 and the verse 22 also teaches us about Christ's impeccability and about the righteousness, the, the obedience to the law which he puts to our account. And it says in Romans 3 and the verse 22, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all men and upon all them that believe. Isn't that wonderful? That the Lord, we find out already in John 1, that the Lord is eternal. He is the second person of the Trinity. He is deity. He is God. He is creator. He is the giver of physical and spiritual life. We find from Hebrews that he is impeccable. He's sinless. And now we find in Romans 3 verse 22 that this God that we're reading about has done something for us. He's, he's lived a righteous life and he's put it to our account. And all we have to do, look what it says in the verse 22 of Romans 3, accept it by faith of Jesus Christ. By faith. Oh, it's not about good works. It's not about church attendance. It's not about uh, giving to the, the Lord's work. It's not about any of these things. It's, it's simply by faith alone. Oh, what a wonderful Savior we have. You know, my friend, when we look at all these things concerning uh, Christ, that is why Solomon of old could write. In Song of Solomon, chapter 5, and the verse 16, Yea, he is altogether lovely. There is nothing about him that isn't lovely. Yea, he is altogether lovely. And Solomon goes on to say, this is my beloved and this is my friend. I ask you, just as we really glimpse at who Christ is tonight, is he your beloved? Is he your friend? And have you in this meeting recognized as yet that yes, in in my life and to my heart and to the best of my, my knowledge from what I read from the Scriptures, that yes, to me, he is altogether lovely. 
Have you understood that yet? Because that is the Christ we're reading about, self-proclaimed in our text in John 12, verse 32. And I, if I be lifted up. And why is all of this important? Well, come with me to 1 Corinthians, please. 1 Corinthians in the chapter 3. I want you all to see this. This is an important text. Because you say, why is it fundamental? Why do we have to to get a grip of who Christ is and what Christ has done? Why is Christ the important one in all of these things? Well, here we find the Apostle Paul telling the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 in the verse 11, it says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You see, if we don't get our foundation right, if we don't lay it out from the start that this I in our text is Christ, if we don't lay that foundation initially, then what we are going to build upon it will not make sense. We need to get a grip of this, that it is Christ. And if Christ was not in the text, then there would be no salvation here. There would be no purpose in the lifting up. There would be no drawing of men unto the Father. There would be none of this salvation. The word I, even though it be little, and even though it only have one word, it is the most important word in the text because it's Christ. And I, if I be lifted up. There we find the Christ of the gospel promise. But secondly, I want you to note now the command in the gospel promise. We see the Christ, now secondly the command. And look what it says in our text. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth. Now there we find some interesting language. Language which may seem strange. But it is language which has been used and employed before in John's gospel. Turn to John chapter 3. We see it used before. John chapter 3, uh, come with me to the verse 14. You remember here that the Lord is speaking to a very intelligent man, a very religious man by the name of Nicodemus, and we find he talks in these same terms of of being lifted up, and, and he's making a reference, an illustration, we could say, to an Old Testament time. He says in the verse 14 of John 3, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Yeah, there we find the reference the Lord is using. The Lord is referring the congregation in in John 12 to days of yore, to the time of Moses, to the time of the children of Israel, when the serpents were across the land, many were dying, many were bitten, and this, this brazen serpent was lifted up, and all they had to do was look and live. You see, it was a picture of Calvary. And it was a picture of Calvary in Moses' day. And the Lord confirms it for us here. As Moses lifted up that serpent, even so must must Calvary take place. The, The Son of Man Himself must be literally lifted up from the earth and hang upon a cross so that men can once again look and live. Oh, you see, this language isn't just used in in John chapter 3, but it's used in John chapter 8 as well. Look at John chapter 8 and the verse 28. We find once again the Lord refers it using the exact same illustration. And it's interesting, the people in John 12 talk about the Son of Man and wonder what the Lord's talking about when he says about the Son of Man being lifted up. That just indicates that these people had heard numerous sermons from the Lord Because the Lord didn't mention himself as the Son of Man in John 12. He mentioned himself as I. But here we find reference to it again. It says in John chapter 8, verse 28, And then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father had taught me, I speak these things. Now, you see, there was confusion back in in John chapter 12, and and there ought not to have been confusion because look at the verse 34. 
We find what the people are talking about, what the crowd are muttering and murmuring as the Lord is preaching. It says in verse 34 of John 12, the people answered him, we have heard out of the Lord that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Well, if they'd listened the first time, they would know. They would know that in John 8, he has said, when the Son of Man is lifted up, you'll know that I am he. I wonder, is that the same today? You've heard a gospel sermon. You know the Christ that has been preached. You know the cross that has been proclaimed. But maybe again tonight, after hearing 101 sermons, still you say, who is this Christ? What is this salvation? Where is this heaven you speak about? How sad it is that so many sinners hear it time and time and time again. And the Lord had it in His day. And once again, He has to repeat Himself repeating the simplicity of the gospel, declaring who he is, that he is the Son of Man. But of course, when he refers to being lifted up, he's using an illustration of Moses, yes, but, but he's talking about Calvary. He's talking about the blood being shed. He's, he's talking about all of these things. And, and I want to make it abundantly clear that to be lifted up, It means that he will be seen by by all men. That's what the text is saying. We'll draw all men unto me. All men will know about it. All men will see it. He is going to be lifted up and he's going to be seen. But also to be lifted up indicates that his death is going to be unnatural. To be lifted up. That's not how a man dies. If a man decreases, if a man fades away and and falls into the dust, that that is maybe a natural death. But, But to be lifted up, That indicates an unnatural death. That indicates the crucifixion. It also indicates a violent death. You see, this is the language the Lord employs. And he's saying, I literally will be lifted up. I will be hanging before you. And it indicates a violent death as well. And a very public death at that. Come with me to chapter 19, please. Chapter 19. I want you to see this... It's really quite wonderful, but, but solemn all at the same time. And as we think about Calvary, and as we think of this lifting up, well, this is what we find in John 19. We find this chapter of the crucifixion. We find the agonies, and we find the unnatural death, and we find the violent death and the public death that the Lord is speaking about when he says, I will be lifted up. And it says in John 19... Look at it with me, please. The verses 1 to 3 initially. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. Verse 2, and the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. You, you think of the unpleasantness. You, you think of the violence here. You think of already the blood that has been shed through the scourging, through the thorns being pushed upon his head. And you think of the mockery and the spittle and and the smiting. You think of it all already before the actual lifting up. And you think of the violence of it all. But then look at verse 16 of John 19. It says, Then delivered he him, therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him. And two other with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. You see, my friends, what what the Lord told us about, what the Lord told us about in John 3, in John 8, in John 12, that I, the Son of Man, will be lifted up. There we find in John 19, verse 18, they crucified him. There we find he was lifted up. There we find against gravity he was literally lifted up and hung in the air in this crucifixion. You see, my friend, the Lord told it as it was, and and sadly it shouldn't have been a surprise to the disciples, but it was. And it's interesting, even when we look at Calvary, look at it says in the verse 19 of John 19, it says, And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, 
For the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written. Note these languages. It's written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Now, I want to make it clear that every word of God is pure. You say, well, why are we given this detail? Well, you remember what John 12 told us now. It told us in our text that he will draw all men unto me, all types of men, all men from different tribes and tongues and nations. And, and here we find another prophecy, another declaring of who Christ is, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And we find it was written in Hebrew. It was written for the Jews, but, but that also signifies it was written for the religious people. It was written for the church-going folk. It was written for, for the people who obeyed the Lord. It was written for, for all those people, like the Nicodemuses. Maybe, maybe they knew the law. They knew the Scripture. They went to the synagogue. They went to the temple once a year. But still, they were unsaved. But then we read it was written in Greek as well. It was written in the language of, of the inten uh, intelligentsia of of the intellectual people and the philosophers of the day. There we find another significant language. The language of the atheist. The language of the man that had no time for the Jewish God. And then we find it was also written in Latin. The Latin was the language of the common people across the Roman Empire at that time. You know, it was written for all men as well. You know, my friend, it just goes to show that what the Lord said, that when he's lifted up, then all men, there's no excuse now, no excuse, all men will know, all men have, have that opportunity, we could say, to, to look and live. Oh, my friend, look at it. It's really quite remarkable, but come back with me, please, to the text, and we find that he's lifted up now, and it is the Christ of God that is lifted up. And, uh, and I, if, if I be lifted up from the earth, Calvary. But then look at the verse 32 again, and look very carefully, and if you're in the habit of marking your Bible, I want you to circle this one word. It says, and I, if I be lifted up. A little word, if. Now, I want to make it clear, but, but this third point is the condition we could say, the condition of the gospel promise. We find the Christ and the command, but now the condition, if, if I be lifted up from the earth. Now, here we find this, this condition. It's an interesting word, and I want to make it abundantly plain, plain that there is no doubt in the Lord's mind. The cross will take place. He will be lifted up. And uh, the blood will be shed. There is no doubt about that. And you say, how do you know there's no doubt about that? Well, in Ephesians 1, we read that the Lord has, has saved and chosen and predestinated from before the foundation of the world. Theologians call that the covenant of redemption. These, these uh, workings, and you could say this covenant or this uh, agreement among the three persons of the Trinity where they have endeavored to, to bring salvation to a lost and sinful people. Well, there's no doubt about it. Before the world is even created, salvation is going to be provided. The Lord is going to be lifted up. Well, what's the if there for? Well, come with me to John chapter 1. We find it again. No surprise, even when the Lord comes to this earth and the Lord has lived for 30 years on the earth and the Lord is beginning His ministry in John 1, we find still it's no surprise to the Lord. The Lord knows I will be lifted up. It is going to happen. The blood is going to take uh, be shed. Calvary is going to take place. Well, in John 1, we find the Lord once again says, there's no doubt about this. Look at John 1 and the verse 10. It says, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You see, all of that could only be possible if he, if he was lifted up. So there's no doubt about this lifting up. So what's the if, therefore? Well, let's keep going through the book of John. Let's see if there's, there's any doubts cast upon it. Well, look at chapter 2 and the verses 19, 20, and 21. We find once again the Lord is very certain about this matter. Calvary will take place. The blood will be shed. It says in John 2 and the verse 19, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, 
And wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. You see there by John 2, still there's no doubt. He's talking about Calvary, talking about the bloodshed. So, so why is there an if in our text? Well, let's read on. Is there any more doubts? Come to John 3 when he's talking to Nicodemus. Is there anything more we can discover? No, we find that reference. We've already looked at it in the verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. No, there's no doubt here. In fact, come with me back to Luke 9, still progressing in the Lord's ministry, of course, but, but this particular instance on the Mount of Transfiguration isn't mentioned in John's gospel. <clears throat> but in Luke 9, we find that the Lord has commenced his ministry. The Lord has, has come up this great mountain, and he's meeting with the Father, but also with Moses and Elias. And we find, well, well is there any doubt here about Calvary, that there won't be a lifting up? Well, let's look at it. Let's look at Luke 9, verse 28. It says, and it came to pass about an eight days after these things, uh, these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistering. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias. And look what it says now in the verse 31, where we catch a glimpse of what they talked about. And it says in the verse 31, who appeared in glory and spake of his decrease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. There we find once again, he, the Lord is speaking with Moses and Elias and before the disciples, but they're too busy sleeping. And he's talking about Calvary. He's talking about being lifted up. He's talking about the blood being shed. So after all that we've seen throughout the whole of, of the Lord's ministry and even before the foundation of the world, this thing is set in stone. The Calvary will take place. Well, why on earth in the verse 13 does it say if? And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Why is there an if there? Well, I want to make it very clear. Very, very clear. But this word, if, emphasizes the need for Calvary. You see, Calvary was already determined. Calvary was going to take place. The Lord could choose us from before the foundation of the world because when the Lord had decreed it would be done, it was as good as done. And this word, if, is a reminder to you and I that if Calvary didn't take place, then there would be no redemption, and there would be no salvation, and there would be no adoption, and there would be no heaven. The word, if, does not show any shadow of doubt upon Calvary. It is a reminder to you and I that if Calvary didn't take place, then there would be no drawing. There would be no salvation. And Hebrews 9 verse 22 tells us this, cementing this doctrine for us tonight, that yes, Calvary was needed, Calvary was going to happen, but it is a reminder to us, it says in Hebrews 9 verse 22, without shedding of blood is no remission. You see, the Lord is reminding us in this word, if the condition if there was no lifting up, if there was no Calvary, then there was no drawing. Oh, that we would realize this. Too many are relying on good works. Too many are relying on church attendance. Too many are relying upon their own righteousnesses, which are as filthy rags. Well, our verse reminds us here, the condition, if there was no Calvary, if there's no blood covering your sin, and there's no salvation, and there's no hope. Therefore, you need the Christ that was lifted up. So trust him now, and trust him without delay. And look what we find here. Oh, probably the most soul-stirring and thrilling portion to a degree of the verse. We find the Christ, the command, the condition, but then number four, the conversions. The conversions, and it says in our text, and I... If I be lifted up from the earth, will, you see, this is a promise now. This is going to happen. Will draw all 
men unto me. You know, my friend, that's why I say this verse is one of the great encouragements for the preacher. It is a gospel promise. Because the Lord has promised that if Calvary took place, which it did, as it was determined that it would happen, and if a preacher preaches Calvary and preaches the blood and preaches the Christ that shed the blood, then he will draw all men unto himself. What an encouragement that is, that it is Christ that does the drawing. But once again, we see language employed from previous sermons here. Come with me to chapter 6 of John's Gospel. John chapter 6 and the verse 44. The Lord uses the same language of drawing, of pulling us in. And you remember as well how the disciples were chosen as, as fishers of men. What do fishermen do? They, they draw in fish. It's the same idea. It's the same language being employed. But then in John 6 and the verse 44, we read this. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. You see the same and similar language being employed in John 12, in the verse 32, that he will draw all men unto himself. You know, when we come to this word, all, you may ask, well, well why is it that some men die and go to hell? Christ did die upon the cross, the blood was shed. <clears throat> there is salvation. That salvation is preached from many a pulpit. Well, why then are not all men in the whole world saved? You see, this all isn't referring to literally every single individual. This all is referring to all types of people. It's referring to all different nations of the world. And we find that in Revelation chapter 7 and the verse 9. You know, that some people have these notions about certain nations. Some uh, Americans think that America is the greatest nation on the world and nearly only Americans will be in heaven. <laughs> you hear some people and they call themselves British Israelites and they think that somehow being British entitles you to, to, to some great glory in heaven. No, it's nonsense. You see, in Revelation chapter 7 and the verse 9, we read that all types of men, doesn't matter what your background, your, your financial class may be, what nation you came from, what language you speak, it doesn't matter. It says in Revelation 7 and the verse 9, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. But there we find an explanation of what the Lord is saying in our text when he says all men, all types of men, even men that would surprise you, are going to be drawn. Because all nations, kindreds, people, and tongues will be drawn and drawn before the throne of God. But then look what it says in our text again, and, and we are drawing to a close soon. We read in our text, John 12, verse 32, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, We'll, we'll draw all men, look at it now, unto me. Unto me. Now, what does that mean? Where are we going? Well, if, if when we're saved, we're drawn unto him, unto Christ, what does that mean? Well, turn over a page to John 14, and we find the explanation of it. This is what it means to be drawn unto me, unto the I, unto Christ. And it says in John 14, verses 1 to 3, <clears throat> Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, look what it says now, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So what does it mean to be drawn unto me? To drawn into salvation drawn into heaven's glory, drawn into a place that has been prepared for you. Oh, what wonderful truths these are. My friend, I wonder today, have you trusted on the finished work of Christ? Because for your soul, that little word, if, is the turning point. Oh yes, Calvary has taken place. The blood has been shed. But I wonder, have you accepted it yet? 
Because Christ has been lifted up. But are you part of the if wondering, am I ever going to trust it? Or am I just going to walk out the church doors for another gospel service and, and trample on the blood that was shed, trample, uh, trample uh, upon the Christ that died? Am I going to trample on the free gift that was given? Uh, or am I going to be one of those, like in Moses' day, and like a Calvary, and am I going to look and live? What are we going to do? What are you going to do, my friend? What a verse this is. Christian, I want you to remember that if we preach Christ, there will be results. The Lord has promised that. He says, my word will not return unto me void. So, so every time you have a conversation with a friend, a colleague, a family member, remember it goes down to eternal value. But in your life, Christian, lift up the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but also remember this. And I pray the child of God, you'll leave encouraged, knowing all that Christ has done if I be lifted up from the earth, when, when we think of Calvary, when we think of that, that essentially very violent language that is used, being lifted up from the earth, isn't it wonderful to know that he will draw us onto him? What a theme, Christian. But I ask you, sinner, why have you not trusted him yet? Why have you not come yet? In fact, what are you waiting for? Because you can be drawn unto him. You can be saved. I ask you, please come. There's an urgency to all of this. The Scriptures say it is time to seek the Lord. The Scriptures put the emphasis on the here and now, the today. Don't leave it till another day. Don't leave it till tomorrow. But come to him now. If you'd like to speak with me, I would be privileged to be your servant for Christ's sake, pointing you through the Scriptures to Christ and Christ alone. But what a verse we find here. <clears throat> and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed, please. Just as we draw to a close, let me ask you, friend, are you saved? If you're not saved, I ask you, why not? Will you come today as God's people are praying? I trust you'll make no delay. The scriptures say, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I trust you'll do that now. Heavenly Father, we thank thee that there, were, the, there was no if on whether Calvary would be completed. We thank thee that Christ was lifted up from the earth. And we do thank thee that for those that look and live, then he will draw all men unto himself. We pray that that may happen tonight. And that we may rejoice in seeing souls saved. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.